Thank you. Uh, welcome. Welcome, everybody. Um, good evening and welcome. And thank you for joining us today for the webinar on diadema and telarum restoration hosted by AGRA and the Institute for Socio-Ecological Research. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Shirley Gunn. I handle the program administration for AGRA. And before we proceed with the presentation, I would like to just review the logistics and the housekeeping for a few uh, people who may not be familiar with using uh, the interpretation option on Zoom. So I will now hand over to Judy Lang, our scientific advisor for AGRA, who will welcome participants, introduce the speakers, and start the program. Thank you again. Hi, everyone. This is Judy Lang. Yes, a huge welcome. Even though most diadema populations remain low nearly 40 years after the original mass mortality event, as you know, no one is sure what their current loss could mean for our reefs. Delighted I am, therefore, to see this high level of interest in diadema restoration. And let's begin. But first, Stacy Williams was already studying diadema in Dominica when she was advised to go to the University of Puerto Rico at Mayaguez for her PhD education. Here she continued her research with this enigmatic species and has stayed in this beautiful part of the island since then. She co-founded the nonprofit Institute for Socioecological Research and has developed the first land-based nursery for corals and sea urchins in Puerto Rico. And with her team, she has now restocked, restocked more than 4,000 diadema on coral reefs around the island. Um, she is assisted tonight by Manuel Omeda Saldana, who received his master's in biological oceanography from UPR Mayaguez. He studied the herbivory effects of diadema in La Parguera, so very important addition to the team. And he currently manages the sea urchin hatchery and nursery. So take it away, Stacy. Thanks, it's Judy. all yours. Thank you. I'm just going to turn off uh, my video just to save on bandwidth. Um, for those uh, who have just um, joined the talk, uh, there are two options because there's a Spanish channel and an English channel. Uh, so if you want to listen to the Spanish channel, uh, if you go to the more option and um, you can select Spanish. So para todo, si quiere escuchar de presentación en español, puede empujar de o de opción more y hay una opción de interpretación en español. So puede escuchar esta presentación en español. Okay, so as Judy mentioned, um, and thank you all for joining uh, tonight to listen um, about the different approaches uh, to the restoration of diadema. So as many of you know, and the reason why we are listening, all listening to this presentation is that coral reefs are changing. Um, they were once, you know, throughout the Caribbean, they were once um, dominated by stony corals, but now we're seeing um, reefs uh, covered in algae um, with a coral loss and loss of other uh, important sesselbenthic invertebrates like uh, sponges and octor corals. And this is a video of a pretty typical reef in Puerto Rico. Uh, you can see it's covered in algae and dictyola and, and calerpa and halameda. Um, and this is a common site uh, around Puerto Rico on the shallow uh, reefs. And 
even more so now, uh, we are starting to see um, this encrusting pacinalid uh, called Rami crusta um, showing up around the different reefs. And it's pretty abundant um, on the east coast of Puerto Rico, um, where I, I've measured it to be at 60% cover. So this Rami crust, and we're seeing this with all pacinalids, um, increase abundance um, at, different, at different coral reefs. Now this pacinalid Rami crusta um, is known to overgrow and uh, smother live coral tissue. And you can see that uh, to the, the, the photos to the right of your screen. So we know that there are some herbivorous fishes um, like surgeon fish and parrotfish, but now that we are seeing this, uh, this uh, increase in abundance of pacinalids and an increase in abundance of dictyota, a lot of these surgeon fish and parrotfish will not eat Rami crusta and they really do not like uh, dictyota. However, sea urchins, what I found in my research, um, actually will eat Rami crusta and other species of pacinellids, and they don't mind eating dictyota. So why not restore uh, sea urchin populations? So tonight I'm going to be talking about um, diadema antelarum, and all, we all know that the, the common name for this species of sea urchin is a long spine sea urchin, as you can see in the picture. And in the 80s, there was a mass mortality, the first, well, the first known recorded mass mortality of this species. And it started uh, in the Panama Canal and it took two fronts. Um, within a year, pretty much the, the entire Car Caribbean region was affected by their die-offs and um, populations uh, decreased by 95 to 100% in some localities. Once, you know, they started dying, scientists started noticing drastic changes on coral reefs, um, on the coral reefs. Uh, they were once, you know, did not have any uh, algae, but then when the die-off occurred, there was an increase in algal cover and in some reports, an increase up to 250% of algae. So they, they their loss, um, there was detrimental effects um, from their loss. Now we're seeing the mass mortality again in 2022. Um, it started, this is a, a timeline. Um, it started in early February uh, in St. Thomas. Um, and it has been everly creeping up in different localities throughout the Caribbean. Um, when we started seeing this uh, in early February, there was a call out to a lot of the managers and scientists um, to start moving the ball along to figure out and to round up the troops to get all eyes on the water and maybe possibly do some sampling. So we started the Diadema Rescue Network. Um, and from then we, have been the the agri page has created a website um a web a web page where you can find all the different information about where this disease the die-off has started and where is it traveling to and you can um, upload and enter your data and it shows a real-time map of um of where where people have uh, observed sick or dead urchins And so far, this is um, this is the current metrics of what is happening right now with the die-off. So there's been more than 350 reports, um, 19 affected jurisdictions. As you can see, the the red dots are the ones that have where people have observed either sick or dead urchins. The green dots are um, show where there's still healthy populations. Um, there's not all bad news. There's still some 12, there's still 12 um, not affected jurisdictions, and this includes Florida. And you can see in the Southern Caribbean, still in Curacao and in Costa Rica and Honduras, um, they are still observing healthy populations. 
Um, and what is really cool about this tool is that um, people can upload pictures. So we, uh, Agra has created this library of photos um, that we can uh, look through and see exactly what are the conditions of the urchins at a, a point of time. So um, this is what, what is going on now. And uh, I will give you the website, uh, the link at the end of the presentation. Um, so you can visit, visit it uh, if you have not done so. So there are stages of mortality. Um, with diadema, it, it's somewhat similar to the mass mortality in the 1980s, though it's showing a little bit of different symptoms. Um, so a healthy urchin um, will, if you approach it or get close to it, it will move its spines pretty quickly. Um, it's able to attach itself to the substrate. When the urchin is actually sick, it has a uh, a lot of trouble attaching itself to the substrate. So you'll see it out in the sand or seagrass or on the bottom of the reef. And it has really no control of mobility. So a lot of times the water, like the wave motions will just rock it back and forth. So this is a, a sign that the sea urchin is sick. Um, it will later start growing lesions so something like what you see on the bottom photo where you start seeing pieces of the skeleton. Um, and then at that point, they're really sick and they'll start dropping spines. Um, so it, it's pretty dramatic and it, and it could occur in a couple days from uh, urchin being healthy, then getting sick and then dying. So this is really quick. So what can we do? I mean, I was out in Puerto Rico, in San Juan, in Escambron uh, uh, last week, and it was really disturbing. Uh, there were, um, the urchins at this reef were really large adults um, that have been around for years, and a lot of them were diseased and dead. Um, so it was a disturbing sight. Um, but we can do some things that to help um, conserve and hopefully replenish these species. So I'll be going over this, um, going briefly over these topics tonight in the presentation. Um, so there are going to be really three parts, um, kind of four parts. Uh, the first one, uh, what are the techniques of restocking? So I'm going to go over briefly the three techniques of restocking. The second part is how can you grow, you know, what are what is the procedure to grow out diadema in the lab? And then the third and fourth part is how, can, how do you go about restocking um, diadema to coral reefs? And I will talk about some alternative herbivores that you can maybe think of also restocking or, um, or protecting. So the definitions, I'm just going to go over some basic definitions. So restoration um, is a process, process of just assisting the recovery of an ecosystem or an organism um, that either the ecosystem has been degraded or that organism like what we're seeing with diadema, their densities have decreased drastically. Uh, restocking it is a me mechanism to enhance the abundance of organisms. So you're gonna hear me talking about restocking or outplanting diadema to the reefs. So there are three ways that we can restock diadema. Uh, we can redistribute healthy populations. We can larval rear uh, the, the sea urchin in lab, or we could post larval collect them in the field. So, Redistribution is just, is another word of saying translocation. So you're taking urchins from a healthy population and you're taking a couple healthy urchins and then you're moving them to an area where there are no adult diadema or no other urchins there. So you're just moving urchins from one place to another. And this has been done a couple times in the Florida Keys by Chapon et al. in 2006. And they had some success um, 
with redistributing uh, urchins. They took urchins from rubble zones that didn't have much sheltered um, to that of actual coral reefs. And what they found, you know, in their experimental plots is that when they did this, uh, algae cover, algal cover decreased, as you can see in these bar graphs in the experimental plot one and two. Um, and also coralline, uh, crustose coralline algae, CCA, increased. So this is a technique that can be, be done. Um, the advantages of this technique, it, the cost is low. Um, you really just need some materials to move diadema from one location to another. Uh, it's really not time consuming because there's really no lab work. It's more field work of counting algae and moving algae. There are some disadvantages is that we really don't know the consequences of removing healthy individuals from uh, one location and then moving them to another. Um, we don't know if thinning out the population will harm uh, that population in the future. Uh, so the second technique that we can um, do to restock diadema is to larval rear them in the lab. Before I go into the process of larval rearing, I just want to uh, go over the life cycle of diadema because it's complex and it will help you understand what life stage I'm talking about in the next um, couple slides. So diadema, the adults release their gametes in the water. So they release their sperm and egg and the egg is fertilized externally in the water. Um, they go through a transition, transition phase, a planktonics phase um, for it could be up to 50 days, maybe even longer than that. It actually has the longest um, planktonic uh, larval duration, planktonic duration, um, than any other species of sea urchins in the Caribbean. Um, it goes through drastic changes where it gets really long arms. Um, and then when it's at this competent larval stage, it is ready to find its like perfect uh, location to then transition to a baby urchin. And that transition phase is called a settler. So you're gonna hear me talk a lot about settlers in the next couple slides. So a settler is really small. Um, the size is between 0.4 to one millimeter in size. So you cannot see these with your naked eye. Um, they, if the settler settles on the substrate and actually uh, survives that stage, it grows into a recruit. And a recruit is basically the first time that you can see with your eyes, the baby sea urchin. So it's really tiny. It has banded spines. Um, and then if it, re if it survives this life, uh, this phase, um, it then grows into a juvenile and then a young adult and then adult. So in the next couple slides, we're going to be talking about basically closing this entire loop in the laboratory. So there are a couple people that are currently doing this, um, and here are their uh, contact information. So uh, Tom Weirs from the Netherlands is doing uh, a larval culture of diadema on a smaller scale. Uh, Josh Patterson from the University of Florida um, is now currently larval rearing diadema on a larger scale. And Mart Mo is the guru of uh, diadema larval rearing. Uh, he's currently retired, but he just published a book that I will um, give you the link at the end of the talk. <clears throat> so the larval development, um, as I mentioned, can be up to 50 days. Um, Josh and Tom actually have, uh, have been able to settle out the larvae uh, close to 35 to 36 days. So they were able to shorten the time span of um, the larval duration of diadema in the lab. So as I mentioned, it goes through drastic changes in, as a uh, larvae. Um, it will start when it starts growing and getting bigger, it starts producing a rudiment that's just basically the beginning of their, their formation of their body. 
And that when they start forming a rudiment and they start growing pedicillaria, which is a modified two feet with the claws and, um, and two feet, then they become a competent larvae. They're ready to settle. And so when they transition into a settler, you can see on the bottom of your screen on day 28, and, and you see a little bit larger settler on day 33, um, they're really tiny. Uh, as I mentioned, their, their size is 0.4 to 1 millimeter in size, and they're usually this red color. So to grow out larvae in the lab, and this is usually, uh, you know, uh, rules for all larvae because they're very sensitive. Um, you need to keep a brood stock. So you need to keep a couple adults in your lab, or if you have the permits and you can collect adults in the wild and bring them back to lab, you have to get them to spawn. And a lot of times what they do to get diadema to, diadema to spawn is to place them in warmer um, water baths. And that um, kind of, it stresses them out a little bit and then they will start spawning. And you have to collect their, eggs and sperm, and then fertilize those eggs. Um, and then you grow out the larvae in different, um, different tanks. And I will show you the different methods that have been used. But you need continuous water movement when you are larval rearing diadema, because the larvae, if you don't have continuous water movement, the larvae will sink to the bottom and will die. You need very, very clean water uh, the water has to be sterilized um, with UV, or if you use bleach, uh, you have to, um, yeah, so you, you need to keep the water uh, really clean when growing out um, the larvae. And what's tricky about raising larvae in lab is that you need a high quality feed. So you need to also um, grow microalgae. And Rhodomonas is a species of macroalgae that is many times used um, to culture diadema. So these are two um, uh, companies or labs that produce starter cultures of algae. Um, and I could send you more information if you're interested. But you, you know, not only have to uh, raise and maintain the larvae, you also have to um, grow out my, microalgae because you have to feed these larvae every single day. So it, it's pretty tricky. So Tom is, is rearing larvae on a smaller scale and what he is using are one liter um, plastic bottles as you can see in the picture to your left. And what he does is that he, he puts these uh, one liter bottles on a shaker table. And that creates that continuous water movement, but it's very gentle to where it doesn't damage the larvae. And he's been very successful in rearing uh, diadema in these larval bottles um, and getting them to settle out. So they right now um, are in the process, hope, well, they submitted a manuscript and it's under review. So hopefully it is accepted, but it goes through the process of how to, um, how to rear the larvae in these one liter bottles with the shaker. Now at a larger scale at the University of Florida or the Florida Aquarium, they use 40, 40 liter um, culture tanks as you can see in these pictures. So these are custom made and it's really hard to see in this picture, but they're rounded. So when you uh, introduce air uh, a gentle stream of air, it keeps the larvae afloat in these larval tanks. So what's tricky about diadema larvae is that they, they grow really long arms. So you need to have enough water movement to keep them suspended, but not too much to damage their arms. So they've seen success uh, with, these, um, with these tanks at the, the University of Florida. And um, I will show you, yeah. So they found that um, keeping the larvae at a low larval density actually will increase the growth. So you wanna stock the tanks um, at a low density 
And what Tom has found is that optimal density to stock tanks is um, using between 0.1 to 0.5 larvae per milliliter. Um, you can grow these larvae at, you know, between the 25 and 28 centigrade. centigrade. Um, and as I mentioned to you before, you have to feed these larvae, um, I believe, every single day. So it depends on the, the life stage of the, 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 the stage of the larvae, but usually you have to feed um, Rhodomonas uh, 15, 15 to 60,000 cells um, per milliliter. So, so you do need to feed, feed these larvae. Uh, Josh and his PhD student, Aaron, have published a paper, and I suggest that this is uh, open access, so you can download this paper. Um, it is a step-by-step -step process on how to rear larvae in the lab. Uh, so this is really good resource if you're interested in, um, in larval rearing diadema. So the advantages of larva rearing is that you can spawn the urchins year round. So you can basically produce urchins year round if you're successful. Uh, the conditions you can control in lab. And um, what you do, like if you are successful in larval rearing and settling out urchins um, and growing them to juveniles or young adults, you bypass a natural predation stage of the settler and recruits um, on coral reefs because you're, you're raising them in lab um, and you're returning them to the reef when they're larger individuals. So you're bypassing this natural predation stage of you know, being a settler and recruit because they're super tiny. You're also, you know, from the other method of redistributing diadema, um, this method, you're actually introducing a new population. Um, so that is an, 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 an advantage of larval rearing. Some disadvantages of rearing larvae in lab is that it is costly. Um, you need the equipment, you need the filtration. Um, it is also pretty intensive because not only do you need to raise the larvae in lab, but you have to grow microalgae. Um, so it, uh, you need a lot of women, men, manpower um, to help in the process. Also, uh, there's a bottleneck um, when larva rearing in the lab is that they many times have a hard time getting the, the larvae to settle. So sometimes they produce a lot of larvae, but uh, that larvae for some strange reason does not want to settle. So that can also be an issue. Um, so the third technique, and this is the technique that we use here in Puerto Rico, is post-larval collection in the field. So as I mentioned before, uh, so the diadema release their gametes in the water, uh, the egg is fertilized, they go through a planktonic stage, and then when they are that competent larvae, and they're ready to then transform into a baby urchin. Um, they then settle an, on a substrate and then metamorphose into a small urchin, which is known as a settler. So this is a picture of a settler and these are tweezers. So you could just see exactly how small they are. So we're doing this technique um, here in Puerto Rico and also Alwyn is doing this in, in Sabo where he's collecting post-larval settlers. So the methods that we're, we use um, is that we have a set of mooring lines and these mooring lines are anchored uh, with cement blocks. And there are buoys that hold, hold the mooring lines up straight. And these buoys are submerged um, about probably about um, five meters below uh, the surface of the water, so no boats or anything um, can hit them or, or drag them. So on these mooring lines, um, we, have, we have another set of lines that we attach settlement plates. And when I'm talking about settlement plates, 
Um, there are these plastic plates uh, that you can see. Let me just pause this video because it shows um, the process. So we use these, uh, these plates that you can, they're just plastic doormats uh, that we get at Ace Hardware. We used to buy them from Kmart. You can find them on Amazon. I believe their grass, the brand is called Grasswork, and we cut them into small squares, uh, 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. And these, these plates are attached to another rope. So we then attach that rope to the mooring line. And in this video, you can see that uh, we are removing the old line and we place them in uh, two liter dry bags. So we place the plates in these two liter dry bags. And when all the plates and the line are in the dry bag, we then uh, close the dry bag so no water can escape. So no urchins can escape. So you can see that in this video. So on each line, we have 20 plates um, and we usually have 30 lines out at a time and we collect 10 lines at one time. It usually takes if we have about seven or eight people helping us, it takes about four hours to go through all the plates, 200 plates. Um, what I found out in my dissertation research is that diadema settle uh, during the summer. So we really focus all our efforts during the summertime. So we set out the plates um, in May and we collect until November. And the plates are out um, for a month at a time. And, uh, and when we go out and we collect those plates, we then replace those plates right away. So we have, um, we have plates for the next month. Now the, the plates are set in the middle of the water column um, between nine to 12 meters of water depth. So guidance, if you're interested in doing a post-larval collection is that I suggest um, you install multiple mooring lines at different locations. And how I figure out where the hotspot of diadema was here in La Perguera is that I set out a bunch of different uh, I set out lines at a bunch of different locations from inshore to offshore. So the location where I collect our settlers is a location where there are no adult diadema. Um, there are tons of trigger fish. I think they settle at this reef, but they can't make it past a juvenile stage before getting eaten. So possibly your hotspot in your locality could be an area where there are no di adult diadema. So what you need to do is to figure out where they are settling. And I, I suggest um, setting out lines in different localities with a couple plates on each line, um, just to see if you can collect um, the, the, the diadema. Um, and then when you figure out where that location is, then you can concentrate all your efforts on that one location. You should also make sure that the plates are situated in the middle of the water column. Um, for my dissertation, I had them from the bottom to all the way to the top of the line. And usually my bottom plates, I, I observed very little settlement. And I think it's due to predation, um, possibly from crabs and, and other organisms. So I suggest um, placing your plates in the middle of the water column. The hot spot for us is between nine to 12 um, meters um, in, in water depth. Um, so where we collect diadema is at the shelf edge in La Perguera. This is an area where um, there is less algal cover, more coral cover. Um, the currents can be strong in this location. Um, as I mentioned, there is a high, uh, high recruitment here, but very low uh, adult diadema, actually adult diadema absent at this location. But you also might want to try in some areas where there is high natural recruitment. If you see a uh, smaller diadema in this one area, maybe set out a line and some plates in that one area to see if you can collect uh, some settlers. Or an area where there is just high uh, density of diadema because um, many times 
uh, diadema will recruit to areas of um, higher densities of adults. So um, I would suggest maybe setting out a couple lines in those areas. We, what we do before, um, and this helps us feed our settlers, uh, is that when we set out the mooring lines in the beginning of the season, we also set out some plastic plates. Um, these are it, just plastic corrugated uh, roofing that we cut into squares and we sandpaper those squares. Uh, and these plates are set out for a couple months and they grow a really nice thick um, or a nice layer of uh, turf algae on them. And they are, uh, you can use them to feed your settlers because the settlers will not feed on mac macro algae at first because they're still developing their mouth parts. So you need to give them something that is softer. So filamentous algae or biofilm, anything like that to feed your feed the settlers, the small guys. So uh, this we have been using these uh, for quite some time, and they and they work uh, wonders when when feeding the settlers. So. The bags, when the, the plates are, are stuffed in the bags and you know, we close those bags underwater, we then bring them up on the boat and we, we transport them back to the Department of Marine Science here at the University of Puerto Rico. Uh, that's where our, uh, the tanks are at. And it usually, I, I believe that the urchins can be in these bags for up to an hour. If you have them in the bags for a, a little bit longer, I suggest putting some aeration in the bags um, because I don't think they could probably last that long without aeration. Um, but uh, within an hour, if you can get them out of the bags, um, they should be okay. Be okay. So as soon as we get back to the lab, we remove the plates and we place them in these blue bins with aeration and we keep those plates uh, submerged underwater. And we, uh, throughout the morning, clip the plates off and we sample individual plates. So as I mentioned, uh, the, these settlers are really small. So we use headlamps to help us uh, ID, ID where the settlers are on these plates because they have these like little florets that the diadema really like to hide in. Um, so you, we use tweezers um, and headlamps to uh, for the sampling process and these white bins so um, to keep the plates in and counters. So here are a couple pictures. The settlers are uh, red, many times red in color. Um, as you can see, you can see they're like little tiny red dots. And these are actually big, bigger settlers. We get even smaller settlers than this. And then when they start getting bigger in size, they start turning black. Here's another picture of a settler, a uh, couple settlers, three settlers. You can see a uh, red uh, with band, bands. So these urchins are um, placed in the tanks and I'll go over the, the growth of the urchins. Um, but there are different, um, Alwyn has used other materials to collect settlers in the field. So if you don't have um, access to these, these plastic AstroTurf mats, you can use um, these egg crates uh, that many people have used, like Margaret Miller and Alina Schmanz and Bach used this um, in, in the 80s. Um, here's a close-up picture of the egg crates. You can also use another type of AstroTurf. Um, he also used rope, didn't get, I don't think, many settlers on this rope. Um, he used a different type of mat and he also used bio balls and he found actually settlement to be higher on bio balls in, in Saba than any other substrate. So you can um, experiment and use other materials to collect settlers if you can't find uh, the plastic, the plastic doormats. So some advantages of this proceed, this technique is that um, you bypass really rearing larvae in lab. You bypass 
You, you don't have to go and you don't have to raise, uh, grow microalgae and um, do all the water changes that you need to do when rearing larvae. Um, you also bypass a really difficult stage of getting those larvae to settle. Um, like uh, rearing larvae in the lab, uh, you also, because you're collecting the settlers from the field and you're growing them to larger sizes in the lab, you're bypassing this really sensitive period in their life to when they're tiny and they're, um, they're uh, you know, they're, they're, um, they're, sorry, brain fart. But yeah, you're by bypassing natural predation of settlers and recruits um, on coral reefs because you're restocking the individuals on larger sizes. So you're grabbing them when they're really small um, and vulnerable to predation by probably crabs or, or uh, worms. Um, also an advantage of this technique is that you're introducing again, a new population. You're not distributing diadema from one population and moving them to areas with um, no to little diadema. Some disadvantages of this technique is that you need to figure out with where they settle. Um, they sometimes, uh, they had some troubles in the USBIs. They, they found an area, um, but it wasn't consistent throughout uh, the years. So you have to figure out where they settle. Um, the collection, if it's anything like Puerto Rico and the USVI, it's usually limited during peak settlement times. And what we find that to be is during the summer. So you can only collect settlers possibly five years, I mean, five months of the year. Um, the There are some costs. I would put this, this technique's cost between uh, redistributing redistrib individuals to that of um, larval rearing. So you need some lab equipment. However, the equipment to collect settlers um, is not that expensive. So there is some um, cost to this technique. So growing out diadema in lab. So when we have, um, whether you're larval rearing, uh, them to settlers or you're collecting settlers from the field, you have to um, feed those settlers, you have to maintain water quality for those settlers because they're very sensitive for them to then grow to recruits and juveniles and then young adults. So there are some things that you will need. Uh, you need a source of seawater. If you're not close to the ocean or the sea, you can make seawater. However, this is costly. Um, you can pump seawater if you have the correct permits. Um, I, if you are in a locality where there is die-off occurring of diadema, I suggest that you treat your water with uh, bleach um, and then dechlorinize or denutralize that bleach with either aeration or sodium thisulfate. Um, you also, you're also going to need to filtrate that water because as I mentioned, the settlers are really sensitive to any type of water change like sediments or changes in salinity or temperature. So you need to keep the, the water relatively clean. So there are different systems that you can work with depending on what equipment you have or you can buy or purchase, um, or if the die off is in your area. So the most, I guess, a lot of people use um, is an open water system. And this is just seawater. This is a very simple diagram. Seawater, you have a, a fresh seawater flowing into your system and then flowing to your individual tanks. And then there, the seawater is then um, being flushed through those tanks and disposed of in some way. So there's no type of connection. So this is an open system. A semi-closed system, and this is what we use here in Puerto Rico, is that we have fresh, fresh seawater flowing into the system, but it's not that much. Um, and then we have 
uh, the tanks connected to the sump. So the water is recirculating between tanks, but there is that uh, influx of fresh seawater. Now a closed system is that you don't have fresh seawater flowing into your system. You only have the tanks connected. Um, and in this type of system, you're going to have to do water changes weekly. Um, I suggest between 10 to 15% water change. Um, you also have to maintain salinity because you're gonna have uh, evaporation. So you have to maintain the salin uh, constant salinity. However, if you do have die off in your location, I suggest you to raise diadema in a closed system because you can, um, you can treat seawater before doing the water change. Um, so like I mentioned, you can bleach it um, and then use th sodium thisulfate or aeration um, to deneutralize the, the bleach. Um, but you also are going to need some filtration. Like for a closed system, you're definitely going to need uh, chemical filtration, probably carbon um, or a protein skimmer. Uh, you'll need mechanical if you have a lot of sediment uh, to either a sand filter or a bead filter. Uh, biological filter is also useful because it creates back, uh, healthy bacteria that breaks down all the waste that the urchins will produce. Um, so you have to keep those things in mind when you are, if you want to raise urchins. Now for diadema, diadema is tricky when raising them in, um, in tanks because they do have really long spines um, and they take up a lot of space. They eat a lot and they poop a lot. So uh, I came up with some, um, some, some metrics, I, I, they're not tested, so, but this is what works in our system. So if a diadema is less than four centimeters in test diameter, uh, I believe that you can have, you can use eight liters per urchin. So you can um, you, well, you, you will need eight liters per urchin. So for the small urchins, you don't need so much space, but for the larger urchins, if they're f larger than four centimeters in test diameter, you're going to need at least 19 liters per urchin. So that gives you an idea if you want to, if you have the permits and want to rescue some diadema, um, depending on their, their size, it will, it will, um, it will, depend on how much space you're going to need um, for the, for that, for maintaining them in tanks. So you're also going to need people power um, because you're going to have to clean the tanks um, and feed the urchins, do the water changes if, um, if you have a closed system. So really overall, what is important in raising diadema in the lab is that you're going to need clean water, um, whether you're using mechanical, chemical, biological, filtration, also UV lights. Um, you're gonna need a source of food. Uh, you're gonna need a lot of aeration to keep these diadema alive in tanks. And you're gonna need the, the permission, the permits to either do collection or maintaining them in the tanks. So just to give you a couple examples of different saltwater systems, these are the saltwater systems that I use in Puerto Rico. So as I mentioned to you before, I have a semi-closed system in all, these are different, uh, I have three individual systems and they're all connected on a semi-closed system. So we have an inflow of fresh seawater, um, but all the tanks are connected. So this can be modified so far, the, knock on wood, the die-off the die hasn't reached um, where we have these tanks. So if it does get any closer, we're going to move to a closed system. So this system I can modify relatively easy to a closed system. Um, but here's, you don't need much, um, as you can see in the next uh, slide, and this is all winds set up in Saba, so you can use plastic bins 
this is a closed system and he actually uses uh, artificial seawater. So he needs to do weekly water changes um, and he keeps them also in our system. We keep lights because you want the growth of algae. Um, so you want the lights on, uh, 12 hours on, 12 hours off. The same with his system. Um, and then you have the system that Josh uses at the University of Florida. Um, it's a bit fancier. Uh, they use natural seawater, but the seawater is uh, very clean with ozone and protein skimmers and all the works. Um, and he has different, uh, a, a little bit of different system. It's, the system is closed. So he also has to do water changes 15% every, uh, every week. And he uses these like little containers um, for the settlers. And then he moves them to larger tanks when they get a little bit bigger. So for our, for our system, we keep settlers in a separate. So to the, the picture to the left is actually the system for the small settlers. So we use smaller tanks for the settlers because they're easier to clean and they're easier to find possible micro predators. Uh, like crabs or shrimps. Um, so I find that when the diadema are smaller, it's better to have them in smaller containers um, than big tanks that you have to always keep an eye on if there's a crab or a fireworm. So once they start growing, then I move them um, to the picture in the middle to these tanks, which are a little bit larger. And then when they get a little bit bigger, then I move them outdoors. Um, so you have to feed the urchins and we feed them twice a week. Um, we are able to collect fresh algae. Uh, they love ulva. This is ulva down here. It's the sea lettuce. Um, it's really nutritious and uh, it's really easy to clean. Um, they, they, but they will eat all species of algae if you give it, give them to it, uh, them. I suggest that once you have the algae is to soak the algae in fresh water for a little bit because it will kill off any possible micro predators um, like worms and then feed the algae to the urchins. Uh, now, if you don't have access to fresh algae, what Josh uses is these algal pellets um, and he gives one pellet per urchin twice a week. Uh, as I mentioned to you before, the urchins do um, poop a lot. So you're going to have to clean the tanks at least once a week or maybe even twice a week uh, to clean all their feces. So I think we're gonna stop here and um, allow for a couple questions before we move on to the next session, which is um, about actual restoring diadema to the coral reefs. Thank you, Stacy. Um, Manuel, I'm going to ask you and the Spanish speakers to stay in the Spanish room because we only have time for one quick question. Okay. And so I'm going to I'm going to give the shorter of the two questions we have so far in English, and we'll hear the others uh, later at the end. Okay. Um, and this question comes from Julio Camacho in Antigua. Uh, Stacy, you have specified using depths from nine to 12 meters for collecting settlers. Any particular reason for this depth interval? Have you even tried shallower and deeper areas of reefs? Yeah, so for my dissertation way back when, I looked at, I put uh, plates at all different types of depths, um, pretty much for the length of the mooring line. And what I found in my research was that the hot spot of settlement was between, uh, really it peaked at 12 meters. So we stick to putting the plates between nine and 12 meters. I suggest um, if you are interested in collecting settlers, um, maybe try just uh, setting plates at different depths and seeing where you collect them. Maybe in the shallow reefs, uh, you're definitely not gonna be able to put them at nine to 12 meters possibly. Um, but I suggest moving them, don't set them close to the, the benthos. You wanna keep them in, um, 
in the water column. So I would I would suggest just experiment and, and see where you are able to collect the settlers. But for us, it's between nine and 12 meters we found to collect the most. In that habitat, presumably. In that habitat, yeah. At the, okay. At the now I'm afraid we're gonna to have to go back to the rest of your presentation. Uh, hang on everybody, it's not as long. We've got through the really tough long. part. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's all it's all uh, easier going from here, and yeah, and yeah. more questions are turning up in the chat, and I'm sure um, Manuel is getting some too, and we will ask them uh, at the end. Okay, and also you can contact me. Um, I'll give you my contact information at the end of this presentation. Feel free uh, to contact me, or we could also talk um, uh, via meets or phone or whatever. So. Okay, on to restocking. So <clears throat> for us, we when we collect the settlers, we um, grow them in the lab and they're in the tanks for about um, up to a year. Um, it depends all on the space that you have um, and the amount of food that you give these urchins. We don't have a lot of space here at the department. So some of the urchins are still really tiny and they're a year old. Um, so if you give them enough space, they will grow really quick. And if you give them enough food. Um, so we usually, uh, it takes about a year for the urchins from when we collect them as settlers uh, to grow them uh, in the tanks to become a young adult. And the, uh, young adults are usually between two to four centimeters in chest diameter. So once they're at that, that size, uh, we know that they're, they're ready uh, to be transported to the reef. You can try um, outplanting smaller urchins. We just keep them at this size um, because they're just a little bit bigger. They're also easier to find um, when you're doing monitoring and you want to see if they're, how high their retention are, is on the reef. So there's some site criteria that you should consider before you move any diadema to a reef. <clears throat> so before you move them to a site, you should make sure that there is enough shelter for them. Uh, as many of you know, they hide during the day in holes and crevices and they come out at night to feed. So I suggest not moving them to flat areas like Gorgonium Plains or pavement areas because there's gonna be limited shelter for them to survive. So they might actually get eaten by fish. Um, so look at the habitat of uh, what you're uh, restoring first. Also, is there a sufficient amount of food on this reef? Most likely, yes, if you're in the Caribbean, uh, but there's still some reefs that don't have much algae. Um, but is there enough algae on the reef? Is there a lot of Dictyota, Padina? They love Padina. Um, uh, Rami Crusta, they will eat. So is there a sufficient amount of food that they can consume? Next, it, are there a lot of predators? Are there a lot of triggerfish? If you have queen triggerfish or ocean triggerfish, um, I suggest maybe not uh, restoring that reef right away or at all maybe because triggerfish love diadema and they might eat all your diadema. So you can play around with this, but we try to avoid areas where there are a lot of triggerfish. Also damselfish. Are there a lot of damselfish uh, on your reef? Um, damselfish won't, will not eat diadema, but they will bother them and they will pick at their spines. And we feel that actually this is one limitation to the retention of restocked diadema um, because they will annoy the diadema and the diadema will you know, just give up and then they will move to different areas. So try to avoid areas um, where they're are not that many damselfish. And we're experimenting, and I don't suggest this at all, but we are experimenting um, in our restoration protocol is thinning out some populations of damselfish before um, placing diadema uh, and also corals on the, on the reef. So hopefully uh, we will have a student um, doing this type of experiment in, in the future, near future. 
also um is there is die off of diadema currently happening in your in your location um so you might want to choose an area that is upstream from where diadema are dying i can't tell you how far upstream um as far as you can get pretty much uh, or wait until um, the die off hopefully has passed and then try um, restocking some some diadema in in your area. So some before you move any diadema, I suggest collecting baseline data. Um, so before you take diadema out to a particular reef, um, here are some metrics that I think are are really good to collect. Um, like what are the original diadema densities at that reef? Uh, you could use belt transects. Uh, Agra, you can use Agra protocol. It, it's awesome to uh, measure uh, diadema densities, also the benthic composition, pretty much all of this. Um, damsel, damselfish abundance, also predator abundance. Um, there's other techniques that you can use, like uh, the point intercept method, uh, what Agra uses, also the line intercept method. Um, what we use are permanent and random quadrats. Uh, so you can see that in the picture to your uh, left. So what we, when I say permanent quadrats is that we just install nails. And so we know exactly where to put that quadrat out when we visit the reef. So we take photos of these quadrats uh, through time and we can measure the change in benthic composition. So actually these quadrats are perfect um, to measure the effects of your restocking um, of diadema. Um, also, you might want to uh, measure uh, the sizes of diadema at that reef before, for restocking diadema. Um, because sometimes, most likely, the diadema at, at your reef are large individuals, so it could help you keep track of the ones that you place on the reef. Um, so these are all metrics um, that I that we all, uh, we measure before we take out diadema, and that you could also measure um, before restocking reefs. Moving diadema. <clears throat> um, from the lab to the field, uh, we use these blue plastic bins and uh, they work really well. At first we used large like rectangular containers and that was a bad idea um, because the water, uh, it's, it acts like a wave pool for the urchins. Um, so the, the, the urchins get washed back and forth in those uh, rectangular containers. So I suggest uh, you using round containers like these laundry bins. Um, the diadema, there's not that much water movement. Um, and the diadema can actually be in this bin uh, it, some, up to six hours. Uh, we're actually tomorrow moving 550 diadema from La Perguera, which is on the farthest southwest of the island to uh, Fajardo, which is on the farthest northeast. So it takes us about three hours drive um, to the actual port. And then we have to then put them on the boat and, and take them to the reef. So it takes us about six hours. So if you have aeration in these, in the, in these containers, the diadema should be fine um, for those six hours. Uh, before, you know, you, if you do want to monitor the effects of their grazing, I suggest um, may, maybe placing corrals if you have the permits. Uh, these corrals are just uh, like chicken wire mesh. Uh, and we usually try to enclose like dead uh, Orbicella annularis heads because a lot of times they're, you know, isolated in sand, uh, air, sandy areas. So you're not harming any corals and it's really easy to install the rebars in sand um, because the diadema, if you do take them out, 
they a lot will just leave the area and um they they love to also escape these corrals so if you can't go often to monitor the died the, the restocked individuals i suggest putting tops on these corrals um for like a couple months um because they will escape these corrals we also do place like a skirt you can kind of see it in this picture um using plastic netting on the bottom because they can escape from the bottom um these corrals should be placed deeper i would not suggest you placing them in shallower areas unless it's really really calm because if you have a lot of wave action um these will break down and it might harm the reef and it also will might harm your urchins so these should be placed um, in deeper water uh and we remove if we do use these corrals we remove them in two months um because we find that actually in a month the diadema that you restock shows some homing behavior and what i mean about homing behavior is that uh they they usually stay in the same area so they find their little hole that they hide in every day every at morning and afternoon and then they go out and graze and then they go back to that same hole so that is called homing behavior so what we find that when we restock the individuals is that they show this homing behavior within like one month of being placed on the reef so we remove these corrals in two months and then um they're free to do whatever they want to do so uh you should have controls um you know these corrals without urchins also um we try and not always like tomorrow we're not going to be able to do this but uh to restock urchins in the later afternoons because it gives them time to acclimate to that reef for at least that one night and hopefully they find their hole um for the next day so you can try moving urchins in the late afternoon uh and what we use to measure uh the effects of herbivory in these corrals is that we um restock these corrals uh at a density between 2 to 5 individuals um per square meter uh square meter yeah because if you have more than that they might run out of food and and you'll notice um within like one month there will be uh not so much food for them if the urchins that we don't place in the corrals uh there's always a set that we just release on the reef and tomorrow actually we're not going to use any corrals this will be the first time that we don't use at least a couple corrals um for urchins uh what we found out in our last set was that uh if you put them in groups between 30 and 50 um it, they kind of stick together for a while and i think it helps them you know like with predation it's like uh you know uh protection by numbers uh and then within like one month they start spreading out and finding their own individual holes so i suggest um actually restocking in larger groups don't try spreading them out that's the mistake that we used um before and it's really hard finding them um during um during the monitoring so what we do um is that we usually go back the next day um to see where they have moved to and if any have gone eaten um and then we go back two days one week two weeks one month and two month um like i said tomorrow since we're going to be 3 hours away we won't be able to go back the next day um but we'll go back in a week to see how they're doing um and to to count to see how many diadema are um actually in the same area and um my suggestion is is you're going to take diadema out to the reef i suggest going out as often as possible because for the first 2 weeks um they escape and they move pretty far uh this is um from the restoration in 2016 and you can see that um the first restocking there were like more than 150 that 
were placed out on the reef. And in the first two weeks, most of them either moved away from the reef or escaped the corrals. Um, so those first two weeks are critical. So I suggest that you go out the next day and if you could go out the next day or the next day, because at least you can track to see where they're, they're moving to. Um, because we found actually urchins uh, as far as 30 meters from the spot, from the original spot. So they do move far. Um, but we have had some high retention. Uh, like in this particular reef, 75% uh, we were able to, to identify um, uh, after, you know, two months and even four months after the monitoring. And, and actually, uh, last outplanting, um, we also had high retention at Cayo Largo. Uh, up to 80% of the urchins. So some of the results um, that we have seen in our restocking efforts here in Puerto Rico, uh, this is a reef uh, on the East Coast, it's called Cayo Diablo, and this was in 2018. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Rami Crusta is really abundant on the East Coast. Um, as you can see in this graph, uh, it's around 60% cover. So this is the dominant substrate. And uh, I, so far I haven't seen parrotfish scrape marks on it. Um, so I believe that sea urchins are the only organisms that are really eating this algae. Um, but you can see that Rami Crusta is really high um, on the reef before putting diadema. And one week of restocking diadema, you can see that Rami Crusta is reduced um, what I'm calling pavement is just clean substrate. You can see that clean substrate is, um, it, it goes up. Um, again, one month after, you can see Rami Cross has reduced, uh, two months. Uh, so in this particular corral, uh, you can see that Rami Cross was reduced by 54% um, within two months. And here's a picture, and here's, you know, a great example of using a quadrat. You can see the two nails um, is that here's a, the before picture of restocking diadema and then two months after. So you can see that they have eaten dictyota um, and then they have also um, eaten Rami Crusta. So El Corral and La Perguera on the other side of the island, uh, this habitat is different. You can see that uh, the algal components are also very different. Dictyota is the main algal component at, at this reef. Um, and also this really thick turf mat with sediment is a, a, the second um, abundant um, algae. Um, so after one week of restocking diadema, you could see they just uh, hammer through the dictyota. Um, also reduce the turf with sediment mats, and you can see clean substrate um, increases. Again, two weeks, one month, two months, and you can see that diadema reduce uh, dictyota by 92% and turf with sediment by 84%. So this is a picture. Uh, this reef was always, had a lot of suspended sediment, always very turbid. Um, so you could kind of see it's very dirty, but you can barely see there's a lot of dictyota. And then two months after, you can see um, there's a lot of CCA, most likely that was hidden by the dictyota, and the substrate's just much more clean. This was last year's restocking, and this was in Cayo Largo. Um, you can see that before it looked like it was just dictyota, but what's tricky about Rami Crusta is that it grows it can actually survive under dictyota and other algal species. So what you think is just dictyota is not the case. Um, so, to, you know, uh, in two weeks they ate the dictyota, but then you see that there's still Rami Crusta, but after one month you can see that they have eaten the Rami Crusta. And then this is two months again. And then these are the permanent transect in just one corral and you can see the before and after um, how clean it is with diadema and what we also do is take uh, top photos of the corral so this is before and then you can see this is after how clean the substrate is so diadema are super efficient in eating algae um, as you can see and these are some of the ways that we can capture that with data um, 
there is um Alwyn in Saba is um or Saba is also using another te technique to increase um, their natural recovery of diadema and he calls it assistant natural recovery and if you um, don't have the time or money to set out mooring lines and collect settlers or um, do larval rearing in lab, what you can do um, is that you can assist their natural recovery. And so what he's been doing is that he's, he's been providing um, some new substrate for urchins to recruit to. So he sets these bio balls uh, uh, above the reef and diadema will recruit to these and then eventually probably migrate to this reef. Um, so I believe he's still collecting data to see how successful this is to them, you know, surviving the settler to recruit stage and then to juvenile stage. But this is something uh, that you might want to try in, in your locality. So if for some reason you can't um, larval rear or, or do anything with diadema or um, there are some alternatives, alternative herbivores um, that you could either protect or restore or restock or larval rear. And I'll just briefly go over this. So you can um, take some action and uh, to your local authorities or your government agency to try to protect um, protect and conserve parrotfish. Um, that's one way to um, increase herbivory in your locality. Um, this is currently done in, you know, the parrotfish are, are banned um, in our fi the fishing of parrotfish is banned in, in Belize and, and in a couple other localities. Um, also, um, people are culturing crabs um, in Mexico, in, in Moat Marine, um, Mithrex crabs, they are um, possibly easier to rear in the lab and they eat also um, fleshy macroalgae like Dictyota. They also eat Halamida. halamida. So th those can be also used to reduce algae on the reefs in, in your area. Um, you can also try larval rearing other sea urchin species that are a little easier to grow in lab. And that's what we're doing here in Puerto Rico. Um, we're larval rearing uh, tripnustes. So, um, and we're going to try with the kind of metra. Uh, we collect the brood stock. Uh, tripnustes is pretty uh, easy to collect uh, their gametes. Um, they usually spawn if you gently shake them. Um, and their, their larval duration is a little bit shorter than diadema and they don't grow as big. So they're easy to, easier to maintain in larval tanks. So it usually takes us between 21 to uh, 26 days to get the larvae to settle. Um, but the trick is, is that you do still need to grow microalgae um, to feed them. And we've been growing isocrisis and chytoceris. Um, which is easier algae to grow and they seem to um, do well on, on this um, microalgae. And uh, tripnustes actually grow really quickly. Uh, this is uh, the picture to the left is 30 days after settlement. So they are also really small, um, but they grow pretty quick. Uh, this is about uh, 0.4 millimeters and this is uh, probably one point, it looks like, uh, 1.7 uh, millimeters in just 15 days. Um, and they're pretty hardy. They're not as sensitive um, as diadema in lab. So you might want to use or try larval rearing tripnustes. And I hope to produce uh, a ma manual um, in how to culture these this species in labs. So um, hopefully within the next year, I can share that information with everyone. So this is the end of our presentation. Um, I like to thank NOAA and Recursus Naturalis. They have funded um, a lot of the diadema restoration here in Puerto Rico. Also AGRA, uh, they have been uh, helpful and like the leaders 
of getting this information out of the die-off and tracking the die-off in the Caribbean. Um, they've been awesome. And uh, here's my contact information below. Uh, my email, also Manuel's email. Um, and our website the, that you can, it's right now under construction, but hopefully will be up uh, where you can find uh, our projects. And here are some material that is of use. You can visit the AGRA's uh, sea urchin die off page where you can find uh, these different YouTube channels, but these are the different workshops that Alwyn and Tom produced um, about diadema cultivation and restoration. Also Martin Moe's um, book on diadema cultural, uh, culture manual is out. Um, and I suggest if you really are interested in larval rearing diadema is to download uh, Aaron's paper. Um, it's very descriptive and um, it's like pretty much a step-by-step -step process of, of larval rearing. So with that, I am done and, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Stacy. And it's almost 8.30. This has been a fantastic talk. We have enough questions to keep people here probably for another half hour. And I'm not <laughs> going to impose that on anybody. But um, if Stacy is willing to stay a little bit longer, and if Manuel is also willing to stay a little bit longer, um, he could bring everybody in the Spanish section, could come to the English section, and we would have uh, questions as long as the audience lasts. But since we still have four minutes before it's 8.30, I'm going to riff off of one of the questions that I've seen in the English section. And it, it's not saying so explicitly, but it's asking if you know what will happen now that you're putting these urchins out when the die-off of the diadema goes through that area. Do you have any expectations as to whether or not your laboratory reared juveniles, which will presumably be in better metabolic condition, maybe stronger immune systems than ones that grew up on the, in nature, um, will be any better at surviving? And will you be able to tell? Um, yeah, that, that is, it's concerning for, yeah. It, I've thought about this a lot, um, whether I should take diadema out right now. Um, but the truth is, we really don't have any space here on the island to keep these urchins and they're really ready to go out. Um, they're at a size um, and we're gonna see how they do. I, I, we, I think we will be able to uh, track them because they're going to be smaller than the urchins already on the reef. And the, the area that we are restocking tomorrow um, has really low diadema densities. So, um, and it's a little bit deeper. So we hope that if the die-off does go through the area, that maybe that deeper reef area um, is not as effective Effect, effect infected as the shallower area and but we, we will have to see um, we're going to be monitoring these urchins um, for the next couple months so we will definitely be able to tell if the ones that we place on the reef um, die also we're, we're taking out like another 550 to another site in a couple weeks in Fajardo too so um We'll see exactly if they survive. I hope they do. Um, but yeah, we just don't have enough space and we're collect we started collecting settlers already. So we need to move these urchins out um, so we can bring the new ones um, in and grow them in lab. Thank you. Manuel, are you in English now with 
Yes. Would you would you like to ask a, a Stacy a question? She said, or maybe maybe translate this this answer first. Okay, would Manuel like to ask Stacy a question? Do you have a question in Spanish, Manuel? Okay, um, I can I can respond to that. At some point, we will make the recording available, and it is possible it will be on uh, the um, the website, the Agro website. Okay, thank you. I'll I'll ask a question from Monique Calderon in St. Lucia. Very informative. If you do not currently have the capacity for larval rearing, would it be a good idea to collaborate with other nurseries in the region to share diadema stock? Perhaps an island in close proximity. And maybe some other people would want to write in the chat their ideas or join that conversation. Yeah, I, I definitely think that would be a good idea. I would just suggest to just talk to your government officials and make sure that it, it's allowed um, and that you have the necessary permits to do any type of transportation of urchins. But if you don't have the capacity or the capabilities of rearing diadema in your location, but maybe there's an island close to you that um, has the tanks and equipment, yeah, I, I, I definitely think that is doable. I suggest that if you do um, do any type of, like what, what can be helpful is that diadema are easy to transport when they're smaller. Um, so if that lab is able to larval rear and get settlers, I would move those urchins um, when they're a little bit bigger, but not too big, like when they're at a, a juvenile stage or a recruit stage, because you can put many urchins in containers um, and then transport them back to your island. And you can even set up some like corral, like shallow water corrals, um, I know St. Lucia, there, you know, the, the shelf is really narrow in some areas, um, but if you have some areas where it's shallow and protected, you can just set up, you know, shallow corrals where they can't escape and set them in cages until they get bigger um, and then move them to the reef. So there's ways to modify um, raising diadema. Like right now we have, we are just out of space. So we have... Um, a lot of diadema in the water right now, like next to the dock, um, waiting to be moved to a reef. So 
you can all, all, you could do it that way. Okay. So, Manuel. Okay, let's see. We still have two thirds of the quorum. So, um, with your permission, I'll, and if the other administrators can stay on for a little, I'll ask a question from Rulio Camacho again. I know you suggested outplanting to areas of high spatial rugosity, something which I fully agree with. However, I've also observed clumps of diadema adjacent to and within seagrass beds that have no spatial variation. Any thoughts on why this happens? <clears throat> yeah, that, that is also common. And what we're seeing in, um, in Puerto Rico is that re diadema are starting, well, I don't think it's starting, but are heavily recruiting to mangroves. Um, so you see really high population, uh, high densities of diadema in mangrove roots. Um, and close to those mangrove roots are usually seagrass beds. So you do see large clumps of diadema in the seagrass beds. Um, it is common. Uh, they, they're usually in these large clumps because they don't have shelter or protection. And you'll find that also sometimes on the reef. And especially if you move urchins to the reef, a lot of times they will stay in clumps for a while um, out of protection. And then when they realize that there's shelter, um, then they will disperse. So a lot of times um, you'll see these them in these clumps is possibly that they're ready to spawn. Um, they should be spawning right now. Well, in Puerto Rico, they spawn during the spring and summertime. It might be like that in uh, where you're located, um, but maybe these groups could indicate that um, they're ready to spawn uh, or they're they're in these clumps because of just protection. They don't have any type of shelter. So yeah, it is common to see them. Um, and people in Florida, um, because a lot of the, the reefs in Florida are flat, they're pavement areas, um, they have been actually producing shelter um, on the reefs for diadema. Um, so you can do that um, with 
cement blocks or other type of structures where you could kind of create homes for them. Um, uh, but yeah, it, it just all depends on, uh, I guess, the capability of, of where you're at and capacity. <clears throat> Awesome. Cannot thank Stacy and Manuel enough. This has been fantastic. There are still questions left to be answered. We'd be here all night, but I have been promised that um, they are being transcribed and Stacy or someone will be able to answer them. And you can all have an opportunity to get your questions uh, responded to. And I'm even seeing a few people here whose questions I didn't have time to ask. But uh, thank you ever so much for coming. Um, I'm really, really optimistic that we can get some new uh, seeds planted uh, around the Caribbean for restoring diadema. We just can't afford to wait the three or four years that it's taken to get to this stage of awareness with the stony coral tissue loss disease um, disaster. And the diadema are dying fast and we need to respond quickly too. So thank you, thank you again. There's, there's some hope though that um, we did, uh, there was a question in the chat if we are planning to collect settlers um, this season and we were able to collect a hundred, I think 116 settlers and that's, that's pretty high for being so early in the season. So um, there is some hope. So we, we are hopeful for uh, collection um, this summer. Um, so hopefully we have some little guys after um, all of this goes through um, this die off. So there, there is a little bit of hope. Oh, and, and before you go, uh... Lynette has reminded me that we were supposed to be asking about future webinars. What kinds of topics would you like to continue to talk about this, uh, to talk about uh, this diadema? And um, 
that will have to go out in the follow-up email when the recording is ready. We'll give you some suggestions and you are absolutely free to also, you know, contribute your own thoughts. I know what I want to ask for, but I won't tell you now. Good night, everybody. And night. thank you so much for coming and staying all this time. Have a good thank evening. You if you haven't eaten, enjoy your supper. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Stacy. Thank you.